Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome today to our TCFD webinar on physical risks. Um, this is part of the TCFD program uh, for banks, the phase two work that uh, has been undertaken over the past year with about 39 different banks from around the world. Uh, what we'll do today is talk through a lot of the different modules and different program programming that has taken place, um, giving you hopefully as uh, members of UNEPFI a bit of a sneak preview into some of the work that will be released um, in September regarding um, physical risk. Uh, what we'll do is um, with a lot of support from our acclimatized colleagues, as well as um, from Professor Rob Wilby, who led the correlation analysis work with the institutions. We'll talk through each of these um, modules, as well as uh, some of the advances made in phase two relative to uh, the first phase of work. Uh, then what we'll do is uh, return to uh, a look ahead at um, some initial thoughts on the next phases of the banking program. And then at the end, we will um, have a discussion and that discussion will be a little bit more wide ranging. Uh, so if you have questions on a particular module, we ask just that you uh, save those for the conclusion. And um, unless you are dialed in on a phone and can't access the um, the web chat, we, we just ask that you use the chat for questions. That way I'll be able to curate the questions, whether they're direct to UNEPFI or whether they're for our acclimatized colleagues and Professor Rob will be regarding the work uh, done in this phase. So just um, those are the brief housekeeping items. And now with that, um, we'll go into the TCFD uh, itself. I'll provide a little bit of an overview of what that, um, what that structure is and a little bit of the work that we've done in this phase before then handing it off to uh, to Richenda Kanal Chen from uh, Acclimatize, one of the co-founders who will talk through the work that they and the team have done with us. So as we begin uh, just moving on to uh, to the kind of origins of the TCFD briefly. Um, so Mark Carney and Mike Bloomberg, uh, along with the Financial uh, Stability Board, recognized that climate risk was a risk that has not been adequately priced or addressed by markets. And so thinking about not only the changes occurring on the transition side, but also in terms of the physical impacts that um, climate change is likely to bring to different sectors, different areas. Uh, needing to have better information is really the key behind the TCFD. And so on uh, this page, page three, one of the key points is to just outline that the TCFD itself is not just a disclosure document, but really a framework for understanding how a firm is attempting to tackle the myriad climate risks that are posed both by the transition to a low carbon economy. Um, we'll talk more about that tomorrow, as well as the physical impacts and um, related harms that come from either extreme weather, as well as incremental changes in things such as the productivity of agricultural land, the value of properties as different, um, different climatic regimes take place. And so, Ultimately, this vision of a TCFD structure and framework is one that aspires to create a, a broad view and broad perspective of what an institution is doing on this topic. And so for financial institutions specifically, the vision really is to provide a, a view from the top down of how is the institution tackling this in terms of governance? What are the... Um, strategic ways that climate risks are being dealt with as well as climate opportunities identified. What are the ways in which risks are being effectively measured and then managed by, um, by both the uh, management as well as the business line? And then what are the specific 
quantitative metrics and targets for the degree of climate risk for things such as expected losses under climate scenario analyses, what are the um, outputs that are being generated. And all of this is not just attempting to produce a disclosure, but produce a view that a stakeholder, whether it be um, a investor in the firm, whether it be a regulator, or whether it be the firm itself, can take as a way of understanding where their climate risk resides and what they're doing to, uh, to best address that. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about the high level um, thoughts on the TCFD program that we've run um, here at UNEPFI. And I know Chen will go into more detail about the physical risk initiatives as that's really the focus of today's conversation. But within um, the TCFD pilot, I think one of the biggest things to note is that we've really expanded the group that participated. And I think that's brought a lot of geographical and experiential diversity to the program. So in the first phase, we had 16 institutions. And in this phase, we were up to 39 institutions with um, exposure on all of the, uh, the inhabited continents. And in a lot of ways that widens the questions of what physical risks institutions will confront, as well as what are some of the commonalities experienced across different geographies and different uh, different institutions. Part of the work that we did on that really rests on, on three pillars. Um, that first one of climate scenarios, the goal there was to understand better not only what the latest climate scenarios are indicating as far as the degree of risk and as far as the emergence of those risks, but what the key assumptions are within those scenarios and how those changes, whether they be an incremental risk to a particular city or particular area or how they are um, in the likelihood or severity of extreme events, how those things are changing. Um, we also then looked on the second pillar around data and methodology at a variety of different data and tool providers to understand better what specifically they are looking uh, they are looking at in assessing uh, the variety of hazards that are confronted, as well as giving institutions a perspective on what data is necessary to be able to make an effective assessment of their climate risk. And so that was um, expanding from phase one, looking at more country level data and also looking at a few other areas of methodology um, that will be spoken about later, such as the correlation analyses. Um, as far as the ultimate goal of this, the key, uh, the key focus was to produce the TCFD reports and to implement the recommendations of that task force on climate related financial disclosures. And so, in our view and conception, it's not enough to just disclose, but rather to really integrate these practices and procedures into the work that's being done. And the way best to do that is really to give each institution an opportunity to think more deeply about what ways their, um, their management, their business lines, and other institutions, um, other aspects of their institution are confronting climate risk. And so with the this program, we are in the midst of producing a few outputs that will be released relatively shortly. I'll show you the timeline. But before I do, just to kind of briefly uh, talk about the specific um, physical risks that are being um, covered, what we've, we've tried to do um, on the physical side is create a playbook, um, a blueprint for us to think about all of the different areas in which we should think about uh, physical risk. So the physical risk tools, um, the exploration of correlation analyses, investigation of data portals on the transition side, which we'll talk about tomorrow, um, work on some of the transition scenarios as well as a transition tool. Um, and then finally, kind of in that combined realm, uh, looking at a set of good practices. This is something we're working on with um, the Institute for International Finance, and it's also uh, something that we're working to build, which is a TCFD database. So 
within all of these outputs um, that are coming over the next couple months, the goal is to really provide the industry with some leading perspective on what are the areas that institutions can continue to up their game and what are the latest developments, both from the regulatory side, from the climate science side, and from the industry that can be leveraged and taken up as part of an effective climate risk management program. And so just to say a few more words, uh, just about the specific dates and um, programming, right now we are um, doing this special members only preview to talk about what the specific uh, risks are um, on physical and transition and what insights have been generated on those two types of risks through this program. Also, uh, for those interested in the next phase of the banking pilot, registration is now open for that. If you're interested, please just reach out to myself or my colleague Remco Fisher uh, to indicate interest. But ultimately, the goal is um, that we will kick off that program in a few months just to, to walk through the deliverables themselves. Um, the first thing that we will um, have in early September is a full on release of this TCFD blueprint that we'll be talking about today on physical risk. Um, there'll also be then a release of the um, TCFD tool um, on transition, uh, which will be a little bit later in the month during climate week. Then there'll be a webinar um, on the transition risk um, report, and that'll cover some of the scenario work that I mentioned with Cicero. And then um, later um, that week at the Global Roundtable, we will kick off um, the new phase of the banking pilot and the investor pilot. And then the last piece related to this phase is the construction of this TCFD database that we're in the process of building that will then become live for member use in the next uh, the next uh, few months. Um, our plan is for uh, for mid December for a release of that. So. Those are the key dates that uh, we, we'd like you to have down and keep in mind. But as I said, we're um, really at this point of really trying to put a, a exclamation point on the work that's been done, wrap it up in a way that is not only useful for, um, for the institutions that participated, but also will provide some guidance for the entire industry. And so what we'll talk about today in this exclusive preview is specifically the physical risk work that was done, the insights generated, and then at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about um, the next phase of work. But with that, um, I will hand it over to Chen at Acclimatize, who will say a little bit contextualizing the work that was done before diving into each of the modules. So I will uh, give the screen to you, Chen, and... Uh, Thank you, David. I'm I'm just trying to share my screen. So if you just give me a moment. Um, I'm pressing share content, David, but it's not letting me. I don't know if you need to give me any kind of permission for that. Let's see. Okay, thank you. It's just maybe presented, David. That's great. So I'll uh, I'll share that now. So uh, have you got that okay? Yep, looks A-OK -okay to me. So if you want to just uh, full screen or however you'd like to do it, um, but Thank you. we see it all right. OK, lovely. Great. OK, so um, so good uh, morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, very good to be speaking to you. My name is Richenda Coddle. I shorten Richenda to Chen. Uh, as David said, I'm CTO and co-founder of Acclimatize. And together with my colleague from Acclimatize, Bob Koza, and Professor Rob Wilby, um, from Loughborough University here in the UK, we'll be taking you through the phase two pilot activities on physical risk and opportunities. Uh, just to get sort of started, I suppose, with a bit of framing in terms of, of uh, where phase two came from, um, as some of you and hopefully many of you will know, we did a, a phase one pilot, uh, uh, which was published back in 2018, um, which discussed physical risks and opportunities, and that was called Navigating a New Climate. And that piece of work, which involved a smaller number of banks, it was 16 banks, 
that aim to uh, develop initial methodologies for banks to look at physical climate risks and also opportunities in their loan portfolios. Now, the phase one pilot made some good progress, um, but we also identified much more that could be done and some challenges during phase one in terms of being able to to help banks to assess physical risk and opportunities um, uh, fully. And so essentially phase two is, is aiming to uh, address some of those challenges. And, and for those of you who are interested, um, the, the, the sort of key challenges and uh, future developments needed that we work through in phase one are reported in chapter five of the phase one report. So essentially our sort of stepping off point for phase two was to go back to that chapter five report uh, section of the report and to say, you know, which of these, uh, which of these uh, areas of further development can we pick off and, and, and work on in phase two. Um, we also had a survey with the with the 39 phase two banks uh, to discuss and sort of agree with them which topics uh, they'd want to see taken forward in phase two. Um, and we've called these topics um, modules. So, so we refer to the modules in the phase two program, which, as David said, end up being uh, all pulled together in the physical risks and opportunities blueprint report, which will be published um, and released in early September. So. In terms of phase two, then, the way we have um, organised phase two, as I said, is, is a series of modules. And essentially what we're doing with these modules is we are trying to fill in pieces of the jigsaw, if you like, on the what we term the cause effect chain that links climate hazards at one end to risks and opportunities for banks at the other end. So this diagram on, on my slide number nine here tries to represent that cause effect chain. So over on the left hand side, we have climate hazards. As David has said, there's both chronic changes in climate conditions and acute uh, or extreme events which are also becoming more frequent and more severe as the climate changes. So those are the first sort of part of the cause effect chain. And then we have this, this block shown in orange in the middle, which is uh, the impacts that those changes in those hazards can have on a bank's clients. And we've said here clients existing or new, it says at the top of this diagram, and I'll explain why we've written that in a moment. Um, so if we have changes in climate hazards, uh, for instance, more extreme events, or as David said, um, reductions in the productivity of, of agriculture in certain parts of the world, or reductions in the outputs from key economic sectors in general, those can affect clients that are in those sectors. So those we're terming client impacts. Now, if those client impacts are left unmanaged, Clients are facing more drought, uh, more more floods, et cetera, et cetera, um, and they will therefore potentially see increases in their costs and, and reductions in their revenues, reductions in their productivity. Then if those are left unmanaged, they can then feed through in terms of, of risk to the bank, which, show, which is shown over here on the far right hand side and ultimately potentially changes in probability of default on loans, for instance. Um, the the but as clients experience the impacts of a changing climate what clients can also do is they can adapt so they can respond to those physical risks for instance in the case of drought they might install more water efficient equipment to, to enable them to to cope better with water shortages and those we term client client adaptation needs um, and then if we think about those client adaptation needs there will then be providers of those adaptation solutions. So in the case I've just mentioned, there will be the providers of, of more water efficient um, equipment or technologies to be used in industrial processes. And so those are called solution providers. So when we think about the client's adaptation needs, the clients essentially needing to spend money to, to cope with changing climate risks, and we think about the solution providers, both of those can essentially represent opportunities for the bank um, to, to help to fund those endeavours. So that's shown over on the right hand side as, as opportunities. Now, the reason I wrote existing or new clients is because it may well be that the clients uh, that there are 
solution providers, there are adaptation solution providers who may not be clients of the bank at the moment, but who might be very much sort of fast growing industry sectors, industry segments. And so it may well be that banks can identify opportunities to uh, extend credit to uh, a new line of, of customers that they haven't uh, uh, had very much involvement with in the past. So that whole sort of cause effect chain, admittedly with sort of various sort of different um, lines to the chain, not just a linear chain, is, is what we're trying to tackle through the phase two program. And the modules in the phase two program are shown on the left hand side of, of this um, graphic, in, but one, two, three, four, and five. And what we've shown is, is how each of these modules maps onto this cause effect chain. So for instance, you can see that our first module on extreme event data and portals is relevant to understanding the climate hazards um, dimension shown on the far left of our cause effect chain. If we look at um, module number five, analysis of opportunities, we can see that that module maps onto client adaptation needs, solution provider opportunity and opportunity to bank. So that's the sort of relationship that we're trying to describe. Um, as you can see, there are some um, of these elements of the cause effect chain that have several modules that, that, that answer them. So there isn't a sort of one to one mapping. So for instance, clients imp client impacts, we have three modules that in different ways help to an answer and to understand the impacts of these climate hazards um, on, on clients. And so what I'm going to do now together with Bob and Rob is to take you through each of these modules um, to give you, as, as uh, David has said, a sort of a foretaste of, of what, we, what we did in each module together with the banks. Um, and for each module, we're going to take you through the sort of the rationale, you know, why is it that we thought this module was, was important to, uh, to address, uh, the objectives, what we were trying to achieve with that module, and briefly what we did for each module. Um, we're not going to try quite take the modules in order, numbers one, two, three, four, and five. We're going to jump around slightly so that uh, between myself and Bob and Rob, we're not sort of toing and froing too much, but we'll make sure that we keep you kind of anchored in where we are in terms of which module we're tackling each uh, with each set of slides. So that is a sort of, if you like, helicopter view of the whole of the phase two program and the modules within it and how they map onto this cause effect chain or chains that I've shown here. So now I'm going to take us on uh, into the first module, which is about extreme events data and portals. And essentially the, the rationale underpinning this is, as everybody I'm sure knows very well, that you know extreme events already uh, affect banks' clients. They already damage physical assets. They can lead to changes in output. They can affect the value of properties in flood prone areas, and they can cause disruption to, to client supply chains and value chains. And these types of events um, are becoming more frequent and more severe, severe as the climate is changing. Different, different amounts of sort of changes in frequency and severity in different parts of the world. It's very much a, a challenging area for the climate scientists to be able to give us uh, reliable and robust projections of how extreme events may change in the future. Uh, but clearly it's a, it's a topic that's of great interest. Um, and so essentially data on how these extreme events may change in the future, as well as a good understanding of extreme events today, as well as data on incremental climate change and its impacts. Th these are some of the core layers of data that, that banks need to, to bring together when they want to analyze physical risks in their portfolios. Now, we very much identified during the phase one pilot that there was uh, quite a lot of research and data available on incremental changes in climate, but that there was much less data available talking about how extreme events would change in the future. And as I said, that's because it's a scientifically challenging thing to do. Um, but it was therefore something that we really wanted to focus on for this second phase. And so the aim of this module was 
to help the, the banks to understand what data portals are out there providing data on both present day and future extreme events. Uh, for banks to understand how they can use those data portals, you know, can they upload data to them? Can they download data from the portals? And what types of statistics do the portals provide? Uh, and how can different sources of extreme events data be brought together? Those sorts of things. Uh, we also wanted to um, help the banks to understand the sort of the real frontiers of, of the scientific research on, on present day and future extreme events. And so we had some very interesting seminars with some leading climate scientists who, who were telling us about, you know, the latest skill model skill that they have in, in um, assessing changes in different types of extreme events. And then we also wanted with this module to, to, to begin a conversation between data providers climate scientists and banks so that there would be um, you know better understanding of everybody's needs and of the of their sort of you know challenges and um, and ways forward in terms of ensuring that that these sorts of data are more readily available to banks and that banks understand how they can be used and also how they shouldn't be misused so that was the sort of aims that we were we were uh, trying to achieve with this with this extreme events data and portals module. So I'm just going to then give you a, a few sort of highlights of, of what we did in this module. Um, we looked at a broad range of extreme events, which are shown in these icons in the top right hand side of this corner. Uh, I won't read them out because you can read them very well, but we tried to tackle a, a range of um, of climate and climate related and weather events. Um, so we've got some things like tropical cyclones that are very much, you know, extreme weather events. We also tried to tackle some variables, for things like landslide and wildfire, which are what we would call climate related events. They're, they're about how climate and weather interact with, uh, you know, the land and uh, um, forests, for instance, in, in order to lead to uh, changes in the risk of, of wildfire. So we looked at that broad set of extreme events. And for each of those extreme events, what we did is we identified a range of providers of data on those extreme events. And in this bottom part of this uh, slide here, you can see I've listed out uh, the providers that we had for in data on coastal flood and sea level rise. Um, so we had a, a range of providers and some of these providers came and presented to the banks. Um, we know that there are many more providers and in fact in the report we, we point uh, we point the, the banks to um, you know various other sources of data on extreme events. So this isn't comprehensive, but it's a good overview of some of the uh, some of the well-known providers. And then we were able to say, are these providers giving data on observed historical events, which is shown by the second grey column in this table, and are they giving data on future? Uh, incidents, future frequency and severity of these extreme events for different time periods, which are shown here 2020 up to 2100. We've also then noted what future scenarios the data are, the data are available for. Um, and so you can see we've looked at less than two degrees C, two degrees C and greater than four degrees C. We could have chosen some intermediate scenarios as well, but we're trying to give a sense of the kind of range of future scenarios that are covered. And then we come on to spatial resolution. Um, and so essentially, the more granular, the, the finer scale the, the data are, um, in general terms, that, that, you know, the more useful the data will be because it helps you to understand uh, in a more localized way um, what, what um, what extreme events will be experienced in different parts of the world and in, in, indeed in different you know, neighborhoods within the city, for instance. The spatial resolution issue is, is more important for some extreme events than others. Um, so for instance, when it comes to understanding future changes in flood risk, uh, you really need to get at the finest scale data that you possibly can because you know it's it's sort of very easy to understand that you know a property um, 
could be maybe just sort of, you know, 10, 20, 30 metres away from another pop property, but they might um, have quite different elevations. And clearly the lower elevation one would be, would, would be, you know, ha have a higher flood risk than one that's further up the hill. So spatial resolution for some extreme events is super important to, to have as fine as you can. We also then talked about the spatial coverage. So, you know, many of the data sets that we identified are global in their scale, but not all of them. And then we talk about the types of outputs that the user can get. Can they actually download the data from those portals so that the, so that the bank can use them internally or, or, or not? And, you know, are there map based products available that help the uh, help to understand the, the spatial variation uh, in a very sort of easy visual way. And then finally, we talk about the licensing cost, um, whether the thing is uh, free to use or whether whether it's a chargeable service. So, so we were trying to lay out this sort of menu of extreme events data providers against these different dimensions um, to hopefully give uh, to give the reader a really good insight into uh, really good flavor into the sorts of um, data portals that are available. Um, the banks involved in the phase two pilot then evaluated these data portals and we've got some really good feedback from the banks, which is included in the report on what they felt and what their experience was of, of using these data portals and and, uh, um, and indeed some, some pointers from the banks about uh, further improvements that they would like to see. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Bob, um, Bob Koza from Acclimatise to take us through the second module, which is a module uh, that covered portfolio physical risk heat mapping. So Bob, I'll hand over to you. And if you just ask me to click you through the slides when you'd like me to. Thank you, thank you Chen. Um, you can hear me okay? Yes. Great, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Koza. I'm Technical Director of Analytics at Acclimatise, and I'll be running you through Module 2, which is the uh, the rationale, um, the benefits and the objectives of the physical risk heat mapping module. So the rationale behind heat mapping, um, if you imagine a very diverse investment portfolio, thousands if not ten thousands of data points, which is investments in a particular subsector, in a particular geography, uh, heat mapping helps provide that early indication of where the higher risks may lie within the portfolio. It can be comprehensive, so it can cover multiple sectors, uh, multiple subsectors, and, um, and it can be global in outlook as well. So it doesn't matter where the investment is globally, the heat mapping can be run on that. Um, and it's quite an efficient process um, um, with the analytics uh, data platform, uh, linking the sectors, to the geographies, and then you can run it quite quickly and efficiently uh, through an analytical framework. Ultimately, it's in line with the general best practice in this assessment. It provides the very first step of a tiered approach. So it provides a focus for deep dive analysis. So where within my diverse portfolio are those elevated risks, either in subsectors or countries or a combination of the two? The outputs can be a matrix, so the portfolio can be segmented by risk rating, so you can have country versus subsector, or you can do further analysis on top of that. So you can have maps with risk scores per country. Um, with the risk score outcomes uh, as well, you can do additional analysis, so you can rank the sectors or the countries or group sectors by their risk as well. So once the data is output, all sorts of different types of analysis can be done. And there are just two examples shown here. Thank you. Next slide, please. So the objectives of module two were ultimately to help improve the understanding of the concept of heat mapping and how it plays a part and role in the overall physical climate risk analysis process. We designed an exercise for the banks to go through um, to think through the range of channels through which physical risks can manifest themselves and the links between vulnerability, hazards, and investment performance. And ultimately, the objective was to help the banks work towards reaching a consensus or consolidated view 
of where the key vulnerabilities may rely, uh, may lie, uh, the related hazards that contribute to those vulnerabilities, and also the, the sectors as well. So we gave the banks a select set of sectors and a, a select set of vulnerability indicators. Next slide, please. So um, we principally follow the IPCC definition of risk, which is effectively the combination of vulnerability, changes in climate hazard, and which can be chronic or acute changes, and also the exposure in a particular geographic location. So within our uh, tool, and there are many others available, uh, we have eight vulnerability indicators which, which attempt to capture the wider value chain of an investment. So it could be, for example, reliance on climate sensitive supplies, all the way through to impacts on labor, health, and productivity. So in our tool, we have eight vulnerability indicators, and each one of those is scored as high, medium, and low, uh, depending on which sector, subsector you're looking at. So vulnerability indicators combined with hazards, combined with the exposure to a particular geography, gives you the, the final risk outcome. Thank you. Next slide, please. So in our exercise, we gave the banks four out of our eight vulnerability indicators. And the four indicators we gave them were natural resources. And this is the reliance of a particular sector or subsector on uh, high quality water or high quality land. Impacts of climate and vulnerability uh, on assets and processes. The market demand for their goods and services uh, is that climatically sensitive and also impacts on labor, health, and productivity, um, and you know, large workforces working out in the open, particularly prone to um, changes in climate. So uh, it was quite a rich exercise, lots of healthy discussion. Uh, we had a few webinars um, for consolidated responses, and then ultimately it was about providing a overall picture across all of the, the banks um, and the sector experts and also the climate change experts who all contributed to it. So this table here doesn't represent the views of any one individual bank. It's a consolidation across um, all, all of the groups that responded to the exercise. Now, clearly, we, we all know that agriculture is highly vulnerable and, and highly at risk from changes in climate, um, but we also saw at uh, groups like the metals and mining um, and the power sector in some instances also returned high vulnerabilities. So um, much like the agriculture sector, the metal mining sector also saw them uh, vulnerable to natural resources such as reliance on water and also competition for water <coughs> with surrounding communities as well. And it's interesting that the, um, the mining sector also raised labor, health and productivity um, workforce working in extreme temperatures, um, impacting on operating hours and lead productivity at mine sites. For the power and energy sector, there was quite a, uh, a variation uh, between the subsectors. But what we did note was that the hydropower and thermal returned high vulnerability to natural resources. Um, and as we know, thermal power plants require lots of food and water. Um, and abstraction and discharge can also be at risk from rising temperatures. So river water is too high, um, um, and the abstraction license and being able to discharge to an already elevated water course. So all of those things can come back and uh, click back on the efficient operation of the thermal power plant. Within the oil and gas sector, uh, extraction of crude petroleum and natural gas was also a uh, high vulnerability to natural resources and also changes in market demand and dependence on outdoor labor. So this particular subsector vulnerable to changing seasonality and market demand, for example, for cooling or heating. Um, so it was very interesting to note that all of these factors came into play um, in the power and energy sector um, in their score. Uh, manufacturing, large assets requiring um, lots of natural resources as well, also scored high. And then interestingly, the, the real estate um, group also said that market demand 
was a key fundamental economic. For example, damage to real estates uh, from storms, wildfires, wildfires, floods, etc. Uh, insurance concerns, rising cost of insurance and insurability uh, all played a part um, in their scoring. So uh, a very rich, um, very diverse guys, and it's really good to, to hear the healthy debate that occurred uh, both within members of the same group and also across the groups as well when we had the, um, the consolidation webinars. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Bob. That's fantastic. Um, now, Bob, I know that you've got to, to leave us shortly, um, but I, I, when we come to questions and answers, if there are any questions on, on the heat mapping, I should be able to pick those up. So thank you very much, Bob. And um, we're now going to turn to Rob Wilby, Professor Rob Wilby, who's going to take us through the correlation analysis work. So over to you, Rob. Thanks, Jen, and welcome, everyone. Uh, as Chen has mentioned, I'm a professor at Loughborough University and I've been providing support to acclimatise on the correlation analysis. And right from the beginning of this um, exercise, I've likened the, the process to us searching through a thick fog for some, some object. We kind of sense it's there, but we can't quite see it. We can't quite touch it, feel it, smell it but we know it's there. And the analogy is that banks hold vast amounts of data and we suspect that within those data sets, there are going to be some very useful relationships and associations with climate related hazards. If only we knew where to look and how to tease them out. So the rationale for this module is very much on linking uh, known climate hazards such as floods and droughts, wildfires and storms to widely used indicators within bank portfolios. So data holdings on property values and revenues, mortgage rates and so forth. And this is being done against a backdrop of research showing that parts of cities, sectors and places that are less vulnerable to climate change are enjoying certain advantages over, over other areas which are perhaps more exposed and some researchers are referring to this phenomenon as climate gentrification and we can see climate gentrification for example in neighborhoods that are less exposed to coastal flooding and storm surges or are perhaps at sea level but better protected by coastal defences that are well maintained and uh, well resourced. And we've been using this technique called correlation analysis to explore relationships between the climate hazards and the um, bank information. Um, we've been using this term correlation analysis uh, to, to really capture a much broader suite, a larger family of techniques for discerning relationships within data sets. And the actual use of correlation analysis we might see as an entry level technique. It is a stepping stone towards uh, more sophisticated techniques, which I'll mention later on. So uh, next slide then, please. So uh, what, did, what did we try to achieve in this module? Well, we try to help the banks to understand the workflow that is involved in correlation and analysis, which begins with the gathering of the relevant data sets, which may be external to the bank and bringing them alongside the data held within the bank. And to then apply correlation analysis between pairs of data sets to look for plausible associations. And here I'm stressing the word association rather than uh, relationship because we can't always directly link um, one set of data to another. The causality between the two may be more complex than we imagine at first glance. Then we've been helping uh, banks to apply this workflow to a correlation analysis um, applied to their own data. And we've been doing that through weekly interactions, 
um, supplying a template, providing feedback on what to do next in the correlation analysis and guiding the banks step by step through that process. We've also been um, describing recent developments in scientific research, giving examples of where correlation and analysis has been used in two particular domains in the area of real estate and the area of, of agriculture and how correlation analysis has been used to, to link climate hazards to financial metrics in each of those um, sectors. And finally, we've, as I mentioned before, highlighted the fact that correlation analysis is really the starting point and leads us to more sophisticated statistical techniques. And indeed, having gone through this process, I think we've learned alongside the banks that other skill sets are also needed, for example, in geospatial or GIS analysis to bring spatial information alongside the climate information alongside the bank's data sets. Next slide, please, Jen. Um, one of the other key deliverables of this module is a comprehensive literature review of correlation analysis applied to both real estate and agriculture. And here we give you an example of a, a table in which we've tried to distill these uh, 50 or so studies into the types of technique, the types of variables used um, to represent the climate drivers or the climate threats and the kind of um, bank or financial inf information that's being brought alongside to try and find that association between the, cl the climate and the financial information and also giving a sense of um, the wide range of countries and locations and regions where these sorts of techniques have been applied. So here, for example, we're looking at the table for um, flood and wildfire analysis as applied to, to real estate. And straight away, you will see on the left hand column that there are all sorts of um, more elaborate techniques here beyond correlation analysis um, that are being used. For example, development of hazard indices um, before and after analysis, which I'll come back to uh, later on, discriminant analysis. These are more sophisticated techniques because they bring together um, multiple sets of data at, um, at once. But one of the most widely used more sophisticated methods is called hedonic pricing analysis. And this really helps us to um, understand the, the rich properties of a data set. So for example, if we're relating uh, property values to um, uh, flood or wildfires, not only do we need to know information about the severity and location of the hazard, we also need, need to know information about the property size, its value, um, even the number of bedrooms, the type of design and, and so forth. And this helps us to understand some of the more subtle signatures that are occurring in the financial information. Next slide, please. And here is the uh, comparable table for the agricultural sector, where here, in some ways, um, the, the correlation analysis is more straightforward because we may be, for example, relating large scale patterns of the climate system to um, uh, crop yields or farm revenues. So there might be a direct more direct cause and effect between, for example, changes in rainfall and changes in the yield of, of corn or other staple crops which underpin the revenue of the farms. But nonetheless, there's also um, lots of other more elaborate techniques beyond correlation analysis that we are signposting in this, uh, in this annex, which will be accompanying the, the main report being launched in September. Next slide, please, Jen. As part of the, um, uh, the, the module, as I mentioned before, we've been sharing a step-by-step a -step workflow with the banks 
which takes us through from sourcing the raw ingredients, the climate data information, um, takes us through looking at the, the data sets for outliers, unusual behaviors, patterns and trends that we might just observe by visual inspection of the data. And, and here I just highlight the fact that there's, there really is no substitute for just taking a careful look at the raw data, doing some basic checks and plots to see what's going on. And then there are some methodological elements that we should be going through, for example, detrending the data to ensure that the associations that we see between the climate index and the financial index is not being biased by simultaneous trends in those two data sets. And then we're, we're moving to the actual correlation analysis where we're um, comparing pairs of data such as uh, the association of property values with the timing and severity and occurrence of a, of a wildfire and emphasizing that often we need to, to benchmark the data to say, okay, how has the price or the revenue changed from this fixed reference point? So that reference point might be in time or it might be in place, but we always need to have some form of counterfactual or control, something we can say this is uh, how the financial information would have behaved if there had been no hazard, if there'd been no flood, wildfire or storm. And that, in essence, is the, the, um, the, 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 the main features of the, of the workflow as illustrated through the exercise in this uh, spreadsheet, which was shared with the banks. Next slide, please. And then finally, um, uh, we're really excited about the uh, ways in which um, some of the participating banks have been applying these tools and these workflows and these data sets to their own data. And we're, we're eagerly looking forward to seeing the results of all that hard work. And here I just list some of the example pilot studies that have been undertaken in this part of the module. And What's really nice about this is that um, we're seeing a diversity of approaches, a diversity of um, data sets and impacts and financial information that's being explored. So whether it's, for example, the relationship between the depth of a flood and the damage to commercial and private properties in Japan, or if we're looking at a, a, a range of different hazards and how they might impact uh, mortgage repayments in Malaysia. Um, some really nice analysis of the link between wildfires and um, changes in property values within certain distance of that event and the links between flooding and property values in, in the UK. And throughout this process, we've been trying to signpost the banks to previous studies so we can learn from them in terms of best practice, get a sense of what types of variables on the climate side and on the bank side might most usefully be brought together. I think that's probably a good place to stop. Thanks, Jen. Perfect, Rob. Thank you very much. So um, so that was Rob talking you through what's module four, the correlation analysis. And you can remember the, uh, this, this, this sort of overarching slide I gave at the very beginning. Um, uh, what that module um, was aiming to do was to, was to develop this understanding, as Rob said, of the relationships between climate hazards and observed impacts that they have had on some financial metrics that are important to important to the banks. So it's about using observed empirical evidence um, uh, to understand these relationships. And, and that is, uh, you know, a really fantastically helpful stepping off point for the banks to be able to then uh, understand and evaluate how future changes in, in these types of hazards could could affect their portfolio. So so 
this correlation analysis was super excited. It was something that was uh, flagged up in the phase one pilot where some of the banks said they were already seeing evidence of uh, drought affecting agricultural borrowers or or storms affecting property. And so it was an area that we really wanted to focus on for, for phase two. And, and, and it's been fantastic to have Rob's um, Rob's rigorous uh, statistical um, skills brought to bear to help help the banks navigate their way through that. Um, I'm now going to take us through a couple more of the modules. Um, in fact, the last two modules that we, we'll cover off before I then hand back to David for some, some concluding remarks from UNEPFI's side. So one of the other modules that we did, um, uh, module number three, was what we termed tools and analytics for physical climate risk assessment of financial risk. Um, now, essentially, in terms of the rationale for that, going back to the phase one pilot, um, during the phase one pilot, we developed a, a, an, an initial methodology in Excel um, for the banks to be, begin to analyze um, the financial impacts that changing climate hazards could have on their customers, on their clients, and in turn, what that could mean for, for probability of default and changes in loan to value ratios for the banks. Now, that methodology we developed in phase one, as I said, was Excel based. We were, we were asked to develop a methodology that the banks could use themselves in house. And, and at the time, the phase one pilot banks um, were comfortable using Excel as an analytical tool. Um, as Rob has said, uh, really, this type of analysis um, should ideally be done in a spatial uh, spatial risk environment uh, using things like GIS. Um, so we were very conscious that by going down an Excel-based route for phase one, all we could do was to provide a very simplified initial assessment of, of physical risk in loan portfolios. And we had to... Um, essentially work at, at data which was at country scale. So we were providing country scale change uh, data on future changes in, in hazards, uh, future changes in incremental climate change impacts. But we're deeply conscious that that doesn't capture the within country variations that uh, that we were, I was discussing earlier and that, that Rob has been discussing, um, talking about the, the sort of discretion that can be achieved with the correlation analysis. Um, this Excel-based methodology, even though it was very simple, <laughs> simplified rather, not simple, simplified, was still very labor intensive to implement, for the banks to implement, to, to, to do more than a sort of a, a sample of borrowers. You know, there was a lot of, of data um, manipulation and processing to be done to, to execute it. And so one of the sort of tough questions we got asked at the start of phase two was, you know, can you develop a a much better tool for us to use in phase two and um, uh, essentially it was sort of something that we we had to kind of confront I guess as a group was that you know for us within the within the scope of this uh, of this pilot to build you know the all singing all dancing tool to enable robust quantification of physical risk in financial terms you know to be able to really assess risks in financial terms for loan portfolios is is a really big endeavor um, and so what we decided to do instead, um, together with the banks, was to acknowledge the fact that there are, um, uh, you know, there are providers of analytical tools um, who have spent many years in some cases developing their, their analytical tools, um, some, some for investors, mostly for investors, but some also aimed at banks. And so we decided that what we could usefully do in this module was to um, expose the banks to uh, the, the tools that are out there on the market to help the banks to understand how they worked and the, the dimensions of the, of the various tools that are out there um, and to get conversations going between the banks and the data providers um, at the oh, sorry at the, the uh, analytical providers at the end of the day um, you know some of the banks in the phase two pilot 
uh, decided that what they would do in phase two was to, to go back to using the the initial Excel based methodology and maybe to strengthen it in house. Um, others have um, had deeper conversations with some of these um, providers of analytical tools um, and maybe taking forward some of those relationships. Uh, so this is um, what I'm going to show you on the next slide is our sort of um, synthesis and review of some of those analytical tools, key analytical tools that are out there. And we were clear that we were really going to be just looking at analytical tools that generate financial metrics or that assess aspects of, of client performance that have got financial consequence. There are many, many other types of analytics and tools out there that might be focusing, for instance, just on the hazard, but we were looking for analytical tools that really tried to capture the financial risk aspects in this module. So on this next slide then, slide number 24, I've got a, um, a, the, a sort of table from our report that shows the, um, the attributes of these tools that we assessed in this module. Um, and these are shown as the rows in this enormous table here. Um, and so we have uh, understanding of the climate scenarios covered in each of the tools, the time horizons they cover, the climate hazards they cover. So those are actually attributes that we also captured for the extreme event data portals earlier on in module one, as you may remember. Um, but but then what we also did for this module is we, we got into understanding how the um, how the different types of analytical tools uh, did the risk analysis element, how they assessed the, the, the physical risk to uh, banks borrowers uh, or indeed to banks whole portfolio. So we have the level of the analysis. Was the, is the tool doing analysis at the level of an individual physical asset? Is it doing an analysis at the level of a, of a company or, or of a sector or a country or indeed a whole portfolio? So. So there's difference in the, in the whether it's a very sort of granular bottom up approach or more of a top down portfolio wide approach. We also looked at what we term the impact channel because there are a, a number of um, channels through which a changing climate can affect uh, the performance of a bank's borrowers. Um, so for instance, a changing climate can affect the macroeconomic environment within which banks borrowers are operating. It can affect the GDP of, of countries and, and interest rates, for instance, inflation and interest rates. It can also, a changing climate can affect supply chains, it can affect operations and assets and markets and customers, as, as Bob was saying earlier on when he was talking about the heat mapping. So we wanted to understand which of those impact channels were covered by the different tools. And then we talked a bit more about the methodology that the tools used, whether it was looking at exposure and vulnerability and, and whether it did some kind of modeling of the physical impact and, and indeed financial modeling. And then finally, we wanted to evaluate, you know, what data does the user need to provide? Um, and that's very much a kind of key concern for the, for the banks uh, to understand what, what the data requirements are from, from for them. Um, a number of these tools uh, have been designed originally for use by investors. So they are tending to look at listed companies. And so very often they're looking at ISIN codes or, or ticker codes to be able to, um, to sort of fix into their own databases that where they might have information about a lot of information about those, those listed companies. Um, the, the issue that a number of the banks raised is that um, those types of uh, data sets are obviously not capturing their clients who might be small and medium sized enterprises um, who, you, you know, non listed companies and therefore, you know, what's what is required of the bank? Does the bank then have to go off and obtain the, you know, those uh, data on those those clients themselves and, and can those tools accommodate the bank? Um, uploading uh, their own data into the tool to be able to an analyze those types of clients. And then we also looked at the outputs that each of these uh, different types of analytical tools will produce, whether they're semi-quantitative, quantitative, and the types of metrics. And as I said, we're most interested in tools that really cover the, provide financial metrics. So that's essentially the attributes that we were capturing with that. Um, 
and we looked at a range of providers. There are other providers um, who, who have tools out on the market, but these were the providers that we had come and present to the banks and really talk through their tools. Um, and within the report, then we discuss these different attributes in more detail and, uh, and how the, um, the different providers respond under, under each of these um, elements of our review framework. So that is what we covered in module three. Um, I'm now going to take us on, you'll be happy to hear the last module from me, <laughs> which is module number five. And module number five is um, to our mind, probably one of the most important topics, but the one that I would say is, is least well understood. Um, uh, within the within the banking community at the moment, in, in, in my experience. And essentially, this module is um, related to understanding the opportunities driven by physical climate risk for banks. Now, what we see is that, you know, very often when, when banks are thinking about physical climate change impacts, and not just banks, but investors, and in fact, many corporates as well, they tend to be thinking about risk, 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 you know, changing hazards, more extreme events, it's going to be a problem, it's going to be a risk management issue for us. But um, what, is, what is missing really from that conversation and what we really wanted to draw out with this module is that the banking sector has a key role to play in funding the uh, the needed investments to respond to those physical risks. And those are termed investments in adaptation or investments in climate resilience. So we're using those two terms, adaptation and climate resilience, to talk about the investments that are needed as banks' clients um, essentially spend money to deal with physical risk or as these adaptation solution providers emerge and um, uh, those who, who really have, you know, opportunity to, to see significant growth um, in, their, in their businesses as the needs for their products and services increase. Um, and really the, uh, the key points that we're trying to sort of draw out under this module is that um, this, uh, this critical role that banks have to play um, in financing um, adaptation and resilience is, is core to the Paris Agreement. And it's something that um, it gets overlooked very often. Uh, when people uh, read the Paris Agreement, they, they uh, see clearly it's, it's is right for very strong emphasis on reducing emissions and ensuring that the transition to a low carbon economy happens as quickly as possible and absolutely essential. But the Paris Agreement is also explicit in saying that there are physical risks that need to be managed, that, that money needs to be spent on adaptation. And Article 2.1c of the Paris Agreement talks about making finance flows consistent with a pathway towards low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. So the Paris Agreement says that there needs to be finance flowing into adaptation to help to address these, uh, these growing adaptation needs. But that is often overlooked, is often not understood. And, and so we wanted to really shine a light on that through this module. Um, the other, the other major initiative, obviously, that UNEPFI has has created um, since we did our phase one pilot, is the principles for responsible banking. And there are many signatory banks, and I imagine some people on this call are signatory banks to the PRB. And those principles commit commit the signatory banks to aligning with the Paris Agreement. So those principles really should be hopefully making banks focus on not just what are we doing in terms of transition, but what are we doing to direct finance towards adaptation. We have another driver within the EU around adaptation, which is the EU Action Plan for Finance and Sustainable Growth and its related sustainable finance taxonomy. And that has been um, evolving over the last couple of years, as, as those of you within Europe will know, I'm sure. And um, that action plan, uh, sorry, the, the sustainable finance taxonomy 
identifies 70 activities in eight sectors, which, which are sort of labelled as making a significant contribution to climate adaptation. So, so the EU is wanting to um, ensure that uh, adaptation measures are uh, being funded and being recognised as contributing to adaptation through this taxonomy. So it's another key driver for banks uh, and other investors to be to be looking at um, uh, the role they're playing and the actions they're taking to deliver on on adaptation uh, adaptation finance. So within the 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 phase one report and deepened deepened in phase two, we've been looking at um, looking at this issue and we have defined um, opportunity in this in the context of this phase one and the phase two pilot as the increase in demand for finance investment insurance and advisory services from banks which will be driven by the physical impacts of climate change on clients and their adaptation and resilience responses so we're trying to help banks to think through this opportunity this opportunity that arises for them to support these much needed investments in in adaptation and resilience so i've just got a few slides that frame that in a little bit more detail and this is a very famous diagram produced by the climate policy initiative uh, that looks at um, climate finance where it has been coming from over on the left hand side and, and where it has been going over on the right and they analyze uh, within this um, when they analyze these finance flows they they analyze whether they're contributing to mitigation which is re reducing greenhouse gas emissions or adaptation or both and what their 2017-18 um, report showed is that essentially only about five percent of the global finance flows are going into adaptation so Adaptation and resilience are really, really under-resourced, um, and uh, this is very widely recognised um, within the uh, within the sort of multilateral development bank community, um, and hopefully will be increasingly recognised within the commercial banking community. That that this demand for finance for adaptation is is only intensifying. Um, so then we sort of say, well, you know, what kind of um, opportunities are there for banks to support borrowers investing in, in adaptation. And what we have on, on this slide number 27 is we have um, a very nice piece of work done by the Global Adaptation and Resilience Investment, the GARI Working Group, where they defined what they termed horizontal and vertical investments. Um, and so horizontal investments are investments in what I termed these adaptation solution providers. That's what this, this, this diagram is showing. So the horizontal investments are companies that provide services uh, that help to manage climate risk. So it can be consulting, it can be forecasting of, of changes in climate or of extreme events. It can be engineering, um, all, all manner of sort of cross-sectoral um, advisory and, and technology services. And then, the, the report also identifies vertical investments in solutions providers, both in water, agriculture, healthcare, energy, coastal areas, and, and financial services. And, and it looks at the scale of the, uh, of the investment opportunities in those. So I'd really recommend that. And, you know, there is tremendous potential here, which is, um, you know, still all to play for and, and, and not, you know, not explored anything like as much as it could be so far. So I've just got a couple of slides then. Um, I'm going to make sure that we've got plenty of time for question and answer where we talk about what have we done then in the pilot to help banks to evaluate these opportunities. So um, we actually developed in, in phase one uh, a framework for banks to evaluate these opportunities. And so this framework essentially provide a, a market analysis or a, an approach to doing a, a market analysis by banks so that a bank can identify, you know, where have we got the greatest opportunities uh, to support our clients uh, investing in adaptation and resilience. And this framework sets out a, a hierarchy of opportunities 
um, thinking about clients who might be managing existing risks, so clients who are already experiencing physical risks of climate change, um, maybe because they're in places that have already have always been prone to extreme events, or because they're starting to see events, extreme events in, and incremental changes in climate intensifying already because of climate change that is well underway. We then also have, looking slightly further into the future, um, clients who, who are starting to respond to emerging risks. So we have you know, a lot of clients now who are beginning to evaluate um, how is a, ch a changing climate going to affect us? What actions do we need to start taking now to start to prepare for those types of risks? Um, we, we already see clients who are making plans and making investment decisions, particularly those involved in uh, sectors with long-lived physical assets, who, who are starting to uh, recognise that if they're investing in, in new assets now, they need to make sure that those assets are going to be able to function really well under a changing climate. So they're investing a bit more at the design stage, at the planning stage, to ensure that these types of assets will be able to function um, as intended over the next couple of decades. And then we have what we refer to as preparing for market shifts. And this is sort of um, looking a bit further into the future. And it's acknowledging that the changing climate is going to lead to, in some cases, some, you know, some really big changes in, in markets that are not yet uh, well understood. Uh, but which, you know, in some cases could be quite transformatory um, and, you know, business as usual will not will not continue in some cases and in some places and some sectors. So we try within the uh, opportunities framework to help banks to um, think through these different sort of timescales um, when they're thinking about the opportunities that uh, that physical climate risk can present to them. Um, actually, applying the framework is fairly straightforward. Essentially, we had developed two scorecards. One is about analysing the market, and the second is about evaluating how well the bank is positioned to respond to that change in the market. Um, and essentially, by essentially filling in these two scorecards and combining the results of these two scorecards, um, banks will be able to see where they have their sort of sweet pot spots for assisting clients, um, supporting them in their adaptation and resilience actions. So it could be supporting clients who are facing physical risk, or they could be supporting these adaptation solutions providers, as I've said. So just briefly, I'm going to take you through those two scorecards and how they're brought together. And that then will round things off from me um, in terms of the of the opportunities module within the phase two pilot. So first of all, we have the module for uh, ass assessing the market. And essentially this module um, involves filling out the scorecard, which is sort of summarized here. Um, and it, and it, it basically requires the bank to think through a set of drivers. One is on policy and regulation. One is on technology evolution, and another is on value chain impacts on sector core financials. And thinking through a set of guiding questions, we also point to resources and indicators that can help to evaluate those different drivers. Um, and then the, uh, the user fills in numbers in the scorecard from from sort of one to one to six from low to high so that is the first scorecard on assessing the market so that is saying you know where is there potential out there in the world where is there going to be need for investment in adaptation who you know what kind of new adaptation solutions are going to be increasingly demanded in different uh, in different segments and then the second scorecard is for the bank then to say, and how are we positioned to take advantage of those um, of those opportunities? So this scorecard is is asking the bank to look at the competitive landscape. How is the bank positioned in each sector or each segment compared to its competitors? The bank's risk appetite, 
and the bank's institutional capacity. Is, has the bank got the sectoral understanding? Does it have um, some clients already in that sector? Is it a sector that the bank knows or a segment that the bank knows? So working through the guiding questions for each of these three drivers and uh, looking at the different types of indicators allows the banks to fill in the, the scorecards uh, for each segment again. So that's the second scorecard. And then essentially what, what the banks do then is to bring together the scorecards. So bring together the, uh, the scores that they've got under the market assessment and on the bank's institutional capacity and positioning. And this would be done for each segment and a segment would be roughly a country and a sector or, or it could just be a sector or it could be a subsector in several countries. It depends how the banks want to divide up their segments. And to end up then with a series of scores against the market assessment and the bank capacity and positioning on these different, under these different sort of time frames of existing risk through to market shifts. And then these scores get brought together finally on a matrix. So this matrix, which is shown here, this two by two matrix, uh, has on its X axis the, the market assessment scores, low to high, and then the bank's institutional capacity and market positioning on the vertical axis, again, low to high. And essentially the bank places each sort of segment um, on, uh, on this matrix according to its score. And that then helps the bank to say, oh, we've got a fantastic opportunity in a particular market segment where, where you know, there's, there's, we can see that the market assessment says there's gonna be high demand uh, for finance in this particular area of adaptation and it's a market we know really well and we've already got an existing client base. So, so it starts to point at where the banks can, can pursue opportunities. And we are very happy to see that some of the banks in the phase two pilot are, are already beginning to uh, identify some of these, these opportunities um, where they can see a real need in their markets uh, and in an area where the bank feels it is really well positioned to offer finance in support of these types of adaptation measures. So that rounds off my uh, or our overview of the of the various modules that we've covered in phase two. As I said, they're covering then the, both the risk side and very importantly, the opportunity side. Um, and I hope it's given you, um, given everybody a sort of a, a good insight into what what you will see when the when the report is is officially launched in September. Um, and with that, um, David, I'm going to hand back to you to take us through uh, the final few slides from your side before we turn over to questions and answer. Great, thanks so much, Chen. Uh, so, just to Just to return to uh, my pages here, um, and we'll talk briefly about the uh, the next phase of work. Uh, so hopefully, uh, hopefully my screen is showing up fine. And uh, just wanted to to say about five minutes on um, where we're planning on going in the next. Um, the next phase of work, we're still in the um, building process of thinking about which uh, which modules and um, and interventions we would like to have. But as I mentioned, um, we are actively collecting interest from uh, participating institutions, and so we are eager to uh, to follow up with any of you with further questions. But to speak a little bit about the program itself, the ultimate goal of the next phase of the TCFD program will be to really be systematic in thinking about the identification, measurement, and management of climate risks and opportunities. Um, not only um, educating firms about different types of climate risks and their implications, but really thinking about what are the latest and best in class ways of getting data on those risks, as well as measuring and then ultimately disclosing and managing them. And 
the goal of that is still to kind of focus in on the TCFD report as a uh, a structure for that and to think about this program as being a way to help those at all levels implement the TCFD. So the vision is recognizing um, as we have in the second phase that many institutions are at different stages in their TCFD journey and also recognizing importantly that these institutions are at uh, at different levels of pressure from various stakeholders, um, different jurisdictions, recognizing that there are certain topics that will be more relevant and more important to um, certain institutions has led us to really try to come up with a framework that aspires to be very nimble, um, while at the same time providing something for uh, for each participant. So as the program continues to go, one of the reinforcing aspects of this will be the a core curriculum. So taking the accumulated knowledge over the past three years of TCFD programs, thinking about climate scenarios, climate tools, recordings, and insights from experts that have been pulled together and that we will continue to pull together, that will form sort of the underlying skeleton of the program. And then to really give that um, that a bit more life and a bit more depth, we will have specific modules focused on different topics of relevance. And those topics can be a deeper exploration of the comparison between climate scenarios, a look at what um, climate stress testing will likely entail a exploration of the correspondence between physical and transition risks, their relationship to one another, as well as their overall uh, relationship uh, to a firm's total risk level. And then um, in terms of integrating and implementing the TCFD, what are the good practices and leading practices across financial institutions for uh, for measuring and then managing climate risk. So these are the areas that we're interested in building these specific modules to get people really working on the topics that are most interesting to them and to really make this as much of a FI led initiative as possible. So while we'll continue to have um, external support and experts, we also really want the industry to continue to um, drive forward a lot of the thinking and to be active collaborators and participators in this work. And so a couple of things that I'd wanna mention just that relate to um, these programs that I think are of, um, of high interest are, especially following the release of the NGFS's reference scenarios with their combination of physical and transition risk. One of the goals that we have in this next phase is to leverage that convening power of the UN to bring different groups of stakeholders together within the program to really talk about the different aspects of climate scenarios, talk about the different assumptions made, and so bring together stakeholders from places like the Potsdam Institute, places like NGFS, institutions um, such as those in the program, and also sector specific experts to provide a deeper sense of understanding and knowledge to what is going on uh, within the scenarios that are explored, whether they be physical or transition. And so that kind of working group and that more collaborative atmosphere is something that the program intends to foster. Uh, returning just briefly to what I talked about as far as that core curriculum, we also um, want to let you know that those who are participants in the program will have access to a wide range of resources and tools that really go along this journey over the last three years with us of what are the different um, tools, what are the different scenarios, what is the data that we have accumulated, and anything that is publicly available and, um, and relevant to our programs. Um, we will and are in the process of curating, and that will form both the backbone of the core curriculum, as well as being an educational resource for you and those at your institution to uh, to benefit from. So I think that's also a particularly important part of this program is just building knowledge and providing opportunities for those who are looking to deepen their knowledge and understanding to uh, to do so. So with that, um, just wanted to. Um, say thank you, um, obviously a big thank you to um, 
to Chen and Bob from Acclimatize for um, both their um, engagement along with many of their other colleagues in the whole program, as well as Rob um, from uh, for his work on uh, on correlation analysis. And now what we'd like to do is just open um, the floor to questions. And as I said, uh, actually, I'll just leave this this including slide up. But as I said, um, if you'd like to uh, ask a question, I ask just that you um, share these in uh, in the specifics of um, sorry in in the specific um, chat box, and then we will be able to uh, to address your questions uh, as they come up. So I think there's a particular Q and A um, function in the chat box. So I would ask you to use that or just um, send things directly uh, into the chat. So to start on uh, on questions, um, as I said, you know we're we're very eager to take questions either on uh, the uh, the work itself on physical risk, the next phase of work, um, other related topics, um, but really um, opening that up to uh, to the group either in the chat or um, in the Q and A. So feel free to uh, to add your questions there, and we'll uh, we'll take them as they come in. So I'll just um, give everyone a moment or two to uh, to add questions, and then I'll curate them for uh, for the group. And I'll also just quickly check just on uh, email for those who have dialed in. Um, so, David, it's Chen here. I can see um, on my side, I can see a couple in the Q&A and, and in the chat as well. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I'd be happy to hear, um, hear your thoughts um, on on any of those, I, I have one from uh, from email, um, just asking about uh, what what do you see as uh, the next steps around uh, around uh, data and kind of hazard mapping? And obviously, we, we talked about at the outset of this program. Uh, now I'm editorializing a bit, but um, at the outside of the, the outset of this program. That a lot of institutions don't have the internal capabilities to do some of this mapping, but um, from from the work that we've done thus far and going forward, uh, how how do you see and how do you advise institutions to uh, to use mapping software and use other types of hazard analysis in uh, in their decision making process? So it's not just a a standalone assessment the way say. Uh, a mortgage provider would look at flood risk or look at a flood map. Um, so thinking about that integrative component, I, um, you know, maybe open that Chen to you and uh, and to the acclimatized folks first. Sure. Thank you, David. Yes. Yeah, so, um, I mean, we, you know, we we have to sort of confront the fact that you know the key thing about physical risk or one of the key things about physical risk is that it is spatially variable you know flood risk here is not the same as flood risk down the road we have to um we have to take that on board and as we've as i said and as rob rob will be said um you know spatial risk analysis is really um required in order to be able to get at that in in a good way um it's been interesting i think with with the you know this phase too that that more banks have come forward who've said that that they have got uh in-house spatial risk analysis capabilities um and quite often it's been you know ferreting around in the bank and discovering <laughs> discovering somebody who might have done an msc in in which has got gis skills in it but uh you know maybe they're not doing that 
doing that job within the bank at the moment, but the skills are there. And obviously banks are full of, you know, fantastic people at, at analysis and um, and certainly some of the kind of, you know, uh, maybe some of the, the younger members of staff will have routinely done the, this sort of thing at, at university if they've done any kind of physical sciences degree. Um, so I think it is um, a, a really um, useful skill set for, for the banks to um, to embrace in order to be able to conduct this kind of analysis in house. Um, I mean, and then other banks have said, actually, you know, what we want to do is, is hire external experts to do it. And, um, you know, uh, uh, but but then then sort of different set of challenges come along, which is around the banks sort of transferring their their data to external providers, which brings its own challenges. So you know either way, whether you do it internally and find your own skills, or or you choose an external provider, in both cases there's going to be sort of practical considerations to to that. And and I, I actually think you know when I really look at all of this from a distance, it's actually really the practical considerations are are the not the biggest hurdles but the most obvious hurdles um and and they are the hurdles that still need, need to be overcome um think you know the, those kinds of things were can we move our data outside the bank to an external expert um have we found somebody in house that's got gis capabilities where are we you know how are we going to pay for that data set etc cetera, etc cetera. so um I really think at this stage we've got, you know, we've got a lot of tools in the toolbox. Um, we've got a lot of science. I mean, Rob showed us this incredible array of, of studies that, that being compiled under the correlation analysis work. Um, what we need is, is, you know, banks need to sort of, you know, basically um, have a go at using them. And, and it is a commitment in time, clearly, uh, to, to get to grips with it. And um, this has been, again, the very positive thing about the, the phase two pilot has been the, the time and effort that banks have put into and the great enthusiasm that the banks have shown in really, you know, getting their hands dirty with these topics. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, it's not a lack of tools and data. I think it's it's a question of sort of having a go, and, and then it's through having a go really that you uncover the, you know, the issues, um, and uh, and start to learn the lessons. Um, but a lot can come out of it, and uh, I think all of the banks that have really thrown themselves into this phase two pilot have uh, have, have, you know, yeah, gained a lot of valuable insights into into the reality of doing this type of work. So get your hands dirty, get on with it, have a go, and uh, and um, everything will sort of come out of the woodwork, I think. Um, I don't know, Rob, whether you'd like to, uh, you know, add anything on top of that. Yeah, just a couple of ad additional points, Jen. I think y you um, make the case for strengthening capacities in geospatial analysis very well. Um, the great thing about GIS is it enables us to bring together data sets in very clever ways. So we can not only explore how relation, relationships might vary in time within a data set, but also um, across space. So this is very important when we're, for example, looking to see the difference in impacts of a hazard between locations that have been um, uh, directly affected by the hazard and those that haven't as a way of creating a control within our data set. So it, it's a it's a very powerful tool. Um, and it's also um, raises the idea that we should be thinking about these hazards in a, in a multivariate way. And throughout the correlation analysis module, I've been stressing the fact that correlation is not causation. There are so many potential confounding factors that can also be influencing the financial information that um, eventually we do need to be moving towards uh, this multivariate approach where we're considering not only the climate hazard data, um, but also in, uh, details of the, the sector or the, or the properties that describe the very nuanced responses and the other factors that may be at play alongside the climate hazard. That's where we're, we're ultimately heading with this analysis to generate more robust answers and, and signals and findings within these very rich data sets. So we don't 
arrive at a false connection between variable A and B when there may be something else at play? Yeah, that, I think that that's a that's a really good point. Um, what, one other uh, question, uh, both for for Rob, um, Chan, and also um, Bob, if you'd like to answer, is is talking a little bit about interactions of physical hazards and how institutions should be thinking both about um, interaction effects. So one of the clear ones, of course, is storms and rising sea level. So you're going to have worse flooding. And I think in uh, Hurricane Sandy, it was estimated that nearly 100,000 people experienced flooding on account of just the fact that sea levels had risen about a foot in New York Harbor since 1900. So clearly you have amplification, but also interaction effects. And related to that, I guess, is a question of second order effects of after an event happens, how do you think about the uh, the overall harms that flow beyond that, whether those are um, loss of business um, in the following months, whether it's a dearth of um, rebuilding funds, whatever it may be. But um, th those are you know, kind of two related points that go beyond just, you know, how frequently, how severe, but I'm um, really interested to get your, uh, your expert perspectives on, uh, on those two related points. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer first, and I'm sure, Rob, you'll, you'll have some, some great insights to offer as well, and, and maybe, Bob, you could um, bring in about the, the heat mapping, I suppose, that, that would, could be a useful uh, sort of point on that as well. So um, it's a, it's a very well made point, David, that um, you know that there can be um, you know, these these hazards that that are uh, you know multiple hazards affecting the same location. Um, and, and the example you've given it you know is of an incremental impact of rising sea levels, gradual rises in sea levels that mean that the uh, that when the storm hits, then the, the return period and the height of the height of the uh, water levels is is higher than it was historically, and it leads to to greater damage. Um, there are, you know, in terms of that specific example, there are um, data portals that are bringing together. So um, when we talked about some of the extreme event data portals, we referred to. Uh, there was a mention of Climate Central and, and Climate Central in their data portal have tried to bring together this understanding of incremental um, sea level rise um, combined with different types of, of storm surge, um, different intensity of storm surge sort of superimposed on top of that. So there is research that is bringing those sorts of factors together. Um, there are, um, I mean, if we if we sort of get, I suppose, to a slightly larger scale, one of the really interesting topics, which I'm sure Rob can talk about, is um, is around um, the large scale climate patterns of things like El Nino Southern Oscillation or ENSO, which some of you might have heard of. Um, and ENSO means that um, that depending on, on the phase of ENSO, there can be some parts of the world that are are experiencing floods while at the same time other parts of the world are experiencing droughts. Um, and this is, a, I think, a very interesting set of relationships for banks that have very um, large and distributed portfolios across the globe um, to understand how some, some clients in some parts of their portfolio might be experiencing floods while our, others are experiencing droughts at the same times. So there are multiple kind of um, uh, relationships between climate parameters operating at different scales that uh, that can um, that can be relevant for banks to understand. I think it can all sound rather overwhelming when you think of all of these things. Um, and this, uh, you know, to my mind is is one of the reasons that we're very keen on two things. One is on recommending that banks start off with a with a heat mapping approach that tries to give a, a broad look at the whole portfolio, um, looking at a broad range of vulnerability indicators. And the second is really the power of these, these correlation analysis and, and other types of statistical techniques for banks to begin to say or begin to understand, you know, where are there 
signals in our own portfolio of, uh, of evidence of, of problems occurring. So I think those are two very powerful tools that can help to um, banks to understand where some of their particular hotspots of risk might be. Rob and Bob, over to you. So um, just, just to continue Chen's conversation there. <clears throat> um, so for us, it, it is about looking at the, the whole value chain. So not to look at any investment in a particular subsector in isolation, um, just as a physical asset, but belonging to a value chain. So uh, environment kicked back on, on the asset. So natural resources, uh, what natural resources does a particular investment require? Does it require lots of land, lots of water, et cetera? Um, in a particular area, is there coastal erosion? Is there also water stress? So each one of those uh, continues to add to a particular vulnerability of the data. Um, and so it adds to the score in a particular location. And then to bring in other factors as well, um, is a particular investment reliant on climate sensitive lives? How could those be influenced as well? So how does that value chain get impacted that way? And the, and the market demand as well. Um, is the market demand reliant on climate? Uh, for example, power and energy supply, heating, cooling, um, tourism, uh, for the uh, tourist uh, hospitality sector. So by looking at that rounded picture and um, a broad set of vulnerability indicators that are recognizable, um, to most people, and then to link the, the changes in hazards under those vulnerability indicators to give a broad brush uh, picture before you do the, um, the detailed type of analysis. We've also found some uh, in interesting aspects in the heat mapping that we've done where we've seen uh, heating requirements then switching over to cooling requirements in the future, and then thinking backwards as well in terms of uh, heating, gas fired quite efficient, switching over to cooling, uh, air conditioning units requiring electricity, uh, much less efficient from converting gas to electricity as well. So all of those factors can also come into play as well. Um, I, I'd just like to add that uh, the interactions between these various hazards is certainly a hot topic in the climate science community. And we're we're gaining some very interesting um, insights. For example, that there are certain combinations of hazards that may may actually become less likely um, when um, certain situations prevail. So, for example, in the UK, um, in a winter that's relatively snowy and dry and cold, we're very uh, unlikely to have uh, floods and storms and storm surges. So you get these clusters of hazards that become mutually exclusive. The other thing that we're learning from the new science is that we can have combinations of hazards that we might not have thought of before. So for example, if you have a powerful hurricane or typhoon that tears through a part of the world where people are heavily dependent upon um, air conditioning units and that storm takes out the electricity supply network and then there's a, a heat wave immediately following that hurricane then we can only begin to imagine the the harms that might arise and and so there you have uh, this notion of these combinations of hazards that are not necessarily occurring at the same time in space but may be occurring in sequence rapidly after one another um, creating an impact. And then finally, as Chen was indicating, there is this whole raft of research now which is looking at the global signatures of major weather patterns like um, El Nino, highlighting areas of the world which might be at one time in flood while others are in drought. And um, what's interesting here is that these different climate patterns, whether it's El Nino, or whether it's the Pacific Decadal Oscillation or the North Atlantic Oscillation, these have slightly different footprints and signatures over the world. Sometimes they operate um, on their own, sometimes in combination. But from our point of view, they're helpful because they might allow us to, 
to look for hedging opportunities where risks might be hedged across the, the planet where one area is exper experiencing uh, high temperatures, another area experiencing low temperatures or too much rain or too little. And so looking at those opposite signs um, across the planet may also um, yield some very useful um, planning uh, and, and opportunities in the future. Great, thanks so much, Rob. So I think we have um, one more question that um, that Chen was going to um, answer. So Chen, I'll let you uh, take that one away. Thank you. So it's a comment from Claudia Kister. Um, sorry, Claudia, it came through a little while ago and we were a bit slow to pick it up. Um, Claudia has, has said, on opportunities for banks of financing adaptation and resilience, is there not a danger that information on the physical risk facing certain countries will tend that firms move out of those countries and instead invest in safer countries. Um, and this is, um, so it's a, a very, very important point, Claudia, and, and one that um, I think concerns, you know, many of us, um, you know, as, as light is shone, <laughs> as light is shone on risk, then there is the, uh, the you know, how do, how do, uh, organizations respond to that knowledge um, and I guess that sort of you know clearly is in some senses this sort of thesis behind the creation of, of the task force on climate related financial disclosures it, you know it wanted to it wanted to to shine a light on where climate risk lies um, in order that investors and others can make risk informed decisions um, but the but is that uh, uh, what what we think um, is that by shining a light on physical risk, um, really what that very much can point to for banks is the opportunities to support these investments in in adaptation. Um, we're already seeing uh, some banks who are who are understanding, for instance, um, in parts of the UK that face increased flood risk. That um, that the last thing the bank wants is for its uh, its mortgage holders to start defaulting on their mortgages. That's that's you know in nobody's interest. So um, you know then the banks are saying, so what role can we play in helping the property owners to install um, you know uh, flood resilience measures in their homes. What you know? What is our role in supporting our clients um, to to manage these risks better? Um, and so I think it's it's in you know it's not in the bank's interest as much as it's not in the client's interest for for uh, people to sort of try to run away from from the risk because then the bank loses clients and and the bank loses money and uh, everyone suffers. Um, it is it is much more powerful to say um, how can we use this information to try to move forward in a way that increases in it and improves uh, the climate resilience outcomes of, of everybody. So that is um, that is you know very much the way that that we and others see it and um, and and we um, you know certainly our experience of the banks in phase two it is it has been very much the way that they have seen it as well and we've seen it in Australia with the with the droughts and the wildfires that they've had in Australia uh, wildfires most recently um, that that the banks there are really sort of stepping up and saying you know we recognise we've got borrowers who are going to struggle with their mortgages so we have to give them a mortgage holiday for a bit but then um, you know we want to then support them as, as they recover from this experience rather than sort of running away and and you know counting ourselves out of that market so so that is uh, um, you know what we believe is is the best way forward on that so I hope Claudia that helps but it's a, a very well made point thank you David Great. Well, Chen, thank you so much for that answer. And I think um, just looking, I don't, I don't see any remaining questions. And as we're nearing the top of the hour, um, I figure it will be nice to to wrap up. So first off, a big thank you, uh, Chen, to you and Bob and the whole Acclimatize team for uh, both the support of the 
UNFFI uh, phase two banking program, but also for uh, discussing it here in this webinar. And we're really excited for next month, not only to release the blueprint report, but also to discuss further uh, some of these interesting issues and carry them forward, obviously, in the next phase of work. Um, also, a special thank you uh, to Professor Rob Wilby for not only joining us today to go over the correlation analysis, but for his really thoughtful and detailed work with a number of the institutions on helping them understand how to best leverage correlation analysis and really providing them with a, a additional set of tools. And as we've talked about thematically in this program, this is about expanding the toolkit. And I think that that kind of work is the very type that is is most additive and most valuable to uh, to institutions looking to uh, confront this uh, this unique and growing challenge. So um, a big thank you to them and also, of course, to um, to you as our UNFFI members. So we're really keen to continue the conversation. As we've noted, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, to me or to any of our other presenters today, either um, with follow-up questions or to learn more about the um, upcoming and ongoing work that we have. So thank you again, and I'll look forward to uh, speaking with many of you quite soon.